Good morning, and welcome to Achieving the Dreams Virtual Adult Learner Summit. We will begin by acknowledging the land on which Achieving the Dream currently has offices. We recognize that each of our communities is built on lands originally lived on and cared for by Native peoples. Achieving the Dream has an office in Silver Spring, Maryland. The land in Silver Spring was originally home to the Piscataway Kanoi tribe who are still active in advancing their citizens through cultural, educational, health, economic development, and social programs in the area. From first contact, early European colonists decimated the health, vitality, and culture of indigenous tribes of the Mid-Atlantic region. After being brought to near extinction, extinction, they are still working to restore and revitalize their culture. The tribes along the Portland Basin and Columbia River and the Pacific Northwest endured centuries of oppression and genocide, yet remained strong in their values. And today, ATD wants to remember the lives and history lost while honoring the tribal nations who continue to live and thrive today. ATD encourages our partners to understand whose land they reside on as a way of acknowledging and giving visibility to the past and enduring tribes. Good morning and welcome to Achieving the Dreams Virtual Adult Learner Summit. We are so pleased to have you join us and over 900 of your peers for a half day of learning and discussion. We are grateful for such an impressive response to the summit, which is a testament to the commitment of our ATD colleges and others in the field to better serve today's adult learners. We are also grateful to our sponsor, the ECMC Foundation, their generosity made it possible for us to offer this summit to our ATD network colleges free of charge, and we will hear from the foundation shortly. As you all are aware, most adult learners bring a range of goals, responsibilities, and strengths to college. Yet, despite the average age of community college students being between 28, our college structures, processes, and cultures are often designed based on the needs of the traditional 18 to 21 year old student. This can result in adult learners taking longer to complete their credential, stopping or dropping out, or not getting connected to their local college at all. The good news, however, is that many colleges across the ATD network have been working to identify and scale promising strategies to enroll, retain, and award degrees and credentials to more adult learners. Today, we will hear from many of those colleges as we collectively explore the diverse experiences of adult learners, students aged 25 and above, and share practical strategies colleges can implement to better serve these students. Before we get started, let's review the agenda and some logistics. First, as you can see, we are using Zoom throughout the event. The agenda for the summit was sent out via email on Friday, May 5th, and again yesterday, May 10th. This is where you will find the links for each of the sessions. We're also dropping the agenda in the chat for ease of access. Second, all of these sessions, with the exception of peer discussions, are being recorded. The recordings and materials shared during each session will be sent to all registrants next week. So if there are multiple sessions you want to attend at one time, you can pick one to attend today and watch the recordings of the other sessions at your leisure. We will be utilizing the chat function throughout the session today to engage with you. We welcome your comments and questions for speakers through the chat feature, which is also being monitored by ATD staff members. There are also ATD staff members available as tech support in case you have any issues during the summit that we can support you with. Closed captioning has been enabled for all sessions. You can find closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any trouble finding that option, please indicate in the chat and an ATD staff member will reach out to you. And finally, while we have built-in breaks throughout the event, please make sure you do what you need to in order to take care of yourself and avoid Zoom fatigue. Now let's review the agenda. We'll start our day together as a full group, hearing from two exceptional leaders in the community college field. 
ATD's president and CEO, Dr. Karen Stout, will kick us off with her own welcome and in true style, will share some national data on adult learners and some perspectives for how this work really shows up at the community college. Then we will hear from Dr. Rebecca Butler, the Executive Vice President at Columbus State Community College. Dr. Rebecca Butler is, is also going to share with us insights and strategies for how Columbus State Community College is supporting its adult learners. We will then go into a five minute break before diving into one of three concurrent sessions. And these concurrent sessions cover a range of topics, including scheduling and program design, credit for prior learning, and outreach strategies to increase adult learner enrollment. After these sessions end at 1.20 p.m. Eastern time, we will go into a longer break before coming back at 1.45 p.m. to one of our four concurrent sessions. Topics during these time slots range from holistic student supports, adult learner recruitment, rapid reskilling programs, and supporting student parents. We'll then have another five minute break and come back to discuss many of the intersectional identities adult learners bring and how better understanding our adult learners holistically can inform our decisions and how we serve them. For these peer discussions, you will all join using the same link. We will be utilizing breakout rooms in these sessions so you can pick the student population you'd most like to focus on from adult veterans to displaced workers, from student parents to our English language, from student parents who are English language learners. More instructions will be provided at the start of the session and each breakout room will have an ATD staff facilitator to help guide the conversation. After these peer discussions, we will have a 15 minute break and then you will have one option of attending one of eight shorter sessions to focus on more targeted topics. And we have a range of innovative and evidence-based strategies being shared during these sessions, during these sessions from experts in the field, including staff and ATV coaches. We'll close out the summit by coming back together at 4.20 p.m. Eastern time to focus on how we can work more effectively together within our colleges and with other institutions in our states to connect more adult learners to the social and economic mobility post-secondary credentials can lead to. As you can see from the agenda, we have a packed half day of learning on a range of topics critical to adult learner access and success in post-secondary education. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for dedicating the time to prepare for the summit and for sharing their expertise with all of us. I'd also like to thank all of our ATD staff and partners particularly those from our Community College Women Succeed Advisory Group for, step, for stepping up to support our attendees as chat moderators, tech support, and facilitators. Finally, this event couldn't have happened without a dedicated planning team and a lot of collaboration across teams within ATD. I would especially like to thank Julia Lawton and Meredith Archer Hatch for leading this effort with a fantastic team of ATD staff. To all those staff who had a role in the planning this event, thank you. I'd now like to ask my colleagues to play the welcome message from our generous sponsor, ECMC Foundation. Hi. My name is Jennifer Zeisler, and I'm a senior program director at ECMC Foundation. Thank you to the Achieving the Dream team for organizing this important event, which ECMC Foundation is thrilled to sponsor. At ECMC Foundation, our mission is to improve higher education for career success among underserved populations through evidence-based innovation. As a foundation, we use a spectrum of funding structures, including strategic grant making, and program related investments to advance our three core strategies, removing barriers to post-secondary completion, building capacity among organizations, institutions, and systems, and transforming the post-secondary ecosystem. As a foundation, 
we fund innovative approaches and promising practices to advance systemic change towards improving post-secondary persistence and degree completion. We, depo we deploy strategically responsive grants and investments designed to nimbly support new solutions to persistent challenges in higher education. And we also invest in key strategies or initiatives, including portfolios addressing student basic needs, advancing single mother student success, enabling transfer and credit mobility, supporting men of color, and fostering leadership in career and technical education. We've seen how innovative approaches can close equity gaps for adult learners, such as creating seamless pathways between non-credit and credit programs. Offering four credit coursework combined with paid hands-on work experience. Utilizing data which centers equity and incorporates adult student perspectives to inform decision making. And ensuring post-completion success, be it transferring to a four-year program or securing a relevant middle skill job. Our vision at ECMC Foundation is for all learners to unlock their fullest potential. I hope you'll visit our website to learn more at ecmcfoundation.org or attend the sessions today featuring my colleagues, Amber Angel and Anna Fontes. Thank you for being here today. On behalf of Achieving the Dream, I'd like to once again thank the ECMC Foundation for funding this event. And now it's my honor to bring to the virtual stage Achieving the Dreams, President and CEO, Dr. Karen Stout. Welcome, Karen. Thanks, Monica. Uh, thank you to you and your team for all of the planning behind the scenes that, uh, that will make this go. Uh, and welcome to what are more than 800 registrants for this uh, first ever adult uh, virtual summit. I want to thank Jennifer at ECMC for her uh, trust in ATD to, to take on this topic. Jennifer is also a member of our Community College Women Succeed Advisory Board, so she has been with us in that capacity for a couple of years and I know personally is very committed to the work that we're gonna engage in today. So it's really special to have her give it a, a, an address to us or a, a thank you to, to us for the work that we're doing. And I, I also wanna give a special call out to Julia Lawton who is on Monica's team, uh, but is also leading uh, some work that we are wrapping up with 20 colleges that are doing some interesting work with adult learners, and you'll hear more about that as today's uh, session goes on. So it's wonderful to see so many of you, so many of you inside the ATD network, and so many of you that are also uh, part of this wonderful community college sector and contributing and engaged in adult learner success, uh, just like ATD colleges. Uh, so spread the word about these types of events and uh, continue to learn with us along the way. The work we're going to engage in today is urgent work. Uh, as the recent Gallup Lumina State of Higher Education report indicates, adult learners still see certificates and certifications or an associate degree as the best post-secondary options for them. And nearly three quarters of unenrolled adults, whether they stopped out from college or never enrolled, see community colleges as the best affordable post-secondary option. But as you know, options and intentions don't always, or more, or more accurately can't always, translate into action, given the financial and other challenges adult learners face. It's little surprise that while the National Student Clearinghouse recently reported that community college enrollments for spring 2023 were up just over 2% since spring 2021, which is good news for our sector. Those numbers don't reflect what is happening with adult learners. The gain, and many of you see this on your campuses, was due to students 20 and younger, with the vast majority coming from dual enrollment programs. All other age groups saw enrollment declines with students between the ages of 25 and 29 dropping over 17% and those 30 and older dropping by over 6%. Now we know 
if we've been looking at our enrollment data and disaggregating it by age, that this is part of a long-term trend. According to a recent analysis of federal data by the Community College Research Center, adult learner enrollments peaked in the fall of 2011, 2011 at just over 3 million students and dropped to under 2 million, 1.8 to be exact, in fall 2021. In addition, the Clearinghouse just reported that we have reached a record high number of individuals with some college and no credential. 40.4 million individuals fall into this category. Over half are 25 years or older. So let's just do the math. There's about 20 million adult learners who could potentially come back and finish a degree or credential. That is over twice as many as the 8.9 million students community colleges enrolled during the same period. Of course, our ability or our inability to help adult learners succeed has a direct impact on their potential economic and social mobility. The Bureau of Labor Statistics data clearly shows that adults age 25 and over with a high school diploma or equivalent had median weekly earnings of $809 in 2021 as compared to $963 for individuals with an associate degree and $1,334 for workers with a bachelor's degree. This is also an equity issue. As CCRC reports, Black, Latinx, Indigenous individuals over age 25 are significantly less likely to have opportunities to access post-secondary education. And when they do, they disproportionately enroll in low wage credentialing pathways. So the imperative for community colleges is to step up and serve adult learners. This will require us to really rethink and redesign institutional strategies and practices. Our institutions are not well designed to meet the needs of adult learners, and we must be. This redesign work starts with developing a common understanding of who the adult learners are that we are seeking to support. You know, we often talk about student populations like adult learners or low income students or first generation students as a group. But we know that the diversity within each of that group group is significant and particular to the communities that we serve. So we must know the personas, the intersecting identities of the adult learners that we are serving. And maybe more importantly, as we talk about adopting a bold new access agenda as part of our work, we need to understand who is missing from our campuses. And if they are missing, where are they? Are they attending other post-secondary credentialing opportunities in your communities? Are they online with a plethora of new, new uh, entities, for-profit and not-for-profit, that are entering the adult learner market because they see an opportunity given the math that I just, uh, that I just talked about? I, we, as part of our uh, work with the Lumina Foundation funded prioritizing adult community education enrollment initiative, many of our colleges have been conducting surveys and focus groups to get input from adult learners in their community. What several institutions discovered is that they were making false assumptions about who the students are, about what they need, and how best to communicate with them about what their college has to offer them. So we need to understand our students. We also need to know where and when and how to connect with our students based on their lived experiences, not based on our institutional prerogatives. We need to design delivery formats to be inclusive of work, inclusive of work, rather than forcing students to make either or choices. I can work, I can't pursue a post-secondary credential. 
I can pursue a post-secondary credential, but I can't work. This might mean reconsidering traditional terms and creating shorter, flexible terms or redesigning advising services so that they're more accessible for adult learners. We need to become career matching organizations for learners, career matching organizations. Uh, we often think of ourselves as lifelong learning institutions. I'd like us to change the lens a little bit and think about ourselves as career matching organizations so that adults can enter and re-enter our colleges seamlessly as they gain credentials, upskill, gain more credentials, and upskill again. And that will include finding ways to more effectively recognize work experience and former college credits or skill building experiences as part of an adult learner's credential pathway. We also need to make sure that we're helping adult learners enter pathways that lead to good sustaining jobs and careers. Among other things, that means breaking down barriers and creating better alignment between credit and non-credit programs essentially eliminating that dichotomy, blurring the line. Our adult learners don't think credit, non-credit. We think credit, non-credit, and impose that structure upon them. A recent RAND study looked at the impact of short-term credentials for low-income students. They found that half of low-income students who completed certificates ended up with middle-class wages within three years, and about four in 10 stacked credentials. But what struck me in that study was that the biggest determinant of whether a certificate completer would continue on to earn another credential was whether they started out in a four credit or non credit program. Low income students who earned non credit certificates rarely went on to stack another credential. That's a design problem with our colleges. Think about that. Think about how your non-credit programs are designed. Similarly, we need to think about how we are designing our courses and classrooms to meet the needs of adult learners. Learners like Janine Wilson at Indian River State College in Florida, who at 49 returned to college and enrolled in a health information technology program. Janine, like many adult students, was nervous about the math requirements. In fact, she said what we hear from many adult students and female adult students. She said, I hate math. She also told us that she was nervous about asking too many questions when she didn't understand something. Fortunately, Indian River was part of an initiative uh, that uh, piloted adaptive courseware in gateway courses like college algebra. And that was an initiative led by our teaching and learning team at ATD. For Janine, she said the courseware meant she didn't have to feel uncomfortable about not getting something right. As she put it, it, afford, it afforded me the luxury of being able to not have to keep asking my professor for help by giving me the tools to solve the problem. She passed that course, got her degree, and is about to begin working on her bachelor's degree. The point here is that redesign begins with knowing what our students need and finding the right mix of programs, supports, and services to meet those needs and the needs of our communities. It sounds so simple, but we all know the complexity of leading change within our institutions. Fortunately, today's summit is going to give you a lot of ideas and resources for you to draw upon as you tackle these issues on your campus. Your challenge will be to understand what lever or groups of levers might work best for you in your local context based on what your adult learners need and to scale that transformation to totally change the adult experience on your campus. Do not leave here adopting a series of small boutique interventions. Try to think about the coherence in bringing those interventions into a scaled strategy to support adult learning on your campus. So again, welcome. Thank you for joining Achieving the Dream in this important work. And I hope your day is as productive and engaging as I believe it will be. 
Uh, and um, as my meditation mantra said to me this morning, uh, smile, breathe, and go slowly. So now I'd like to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Rebecca Butler. Dr. Butler is the Executive Vice President at Columbus State Community College. Columbus State has been an ATD network college since 2012 and is an ATD leader college with distinction. Columbus State also won ATD's highest award, the Leah Meyer Austin Award in 2019 for its transformative student success work, particularly how Columbus State works to develop partnerships to create seamless paths for their students from high school into the workforce. Rebecca has held the position of executive vice president since 2018, and she also served as the vice president for enrollment management and student services. She's also on the advisory board for the Achieving the Dream Community College Women Succeed initiative, which is focused on identifying and promoting effective strategies that help adult women students, particularly student mothers, succeed in community college. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca Butler. Hi, Rebecca. Hello, good Thursday. Thank you, Dr. Stout. Thank you, Dr. Trent. I wanna extend my thanks uh, to uh, Achieving the Dream for putting together this critically important summit for us. I wanna thank the ECMC Foundation for your faith uh, in what we do and who we serve and the Community College Women Succeed Advisory Committee of the many uh, opportunities that we have when we can serve uh, the students that we uh, serve and are here for every day, uh, that is the most rewarding. As Dr. Stout said, my name is Rebecca Butler. I use she, her pronouns. I am the proud daughter of a mother who was part of the Appalachian migration. And I am the proud granddaughter of a woman who decided in 1940 that the husband she was married to was not going to be a supportive partner for her, my dad, and my uncles. So in 1940, she forged her own journey and she forged her own life with my dad and my uncles. And in both cases, my mother and my grandmother did the one thing that has had generational effects they pursued education for their families. So I have the great honor of getting us started today, setting the stage. Uh, it is my absolute privilege in doing that. The real stars are the colleagues that we are gonna hear from throughout this afternoon, the practitioners in the field making a real difference for our adult students every day. So as we harness the urgency that Dr. Stout uh, ran us through with all of the statistics, all of the opportunity that we have before us. This, this sense of urgency requires personal and professional frameworks to get us started. So as I transition to slides, let me say this about the chat. Please use the chat today for several reasons. One, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Uh, so as you get to know each other virtually, and we bring this virtual community together via chat, use the chat to get to know one another, to express your ideas and thoughts. If it turns out that you have questions, comments, et cetera, for me, and we do not have time uh, to get into those today, I promise I will, I will respond uh, after, after the keynote today. So let's get started. So we are gonna ground ourselves by getting started in stories. Data are the summary of thousands and thousands of stories. And so let's get started in understanding that yes, the data is critically important in what we do. We are evidence-based and we are data and outcome centered. But our why are the hundreds of thousands of stories that the data represent. For those of us who've had the privilege and the honor to be part of DREAM, every year 
dream scholars share their why, their stories, their dreams with us. It galvanizes us, it inspires us, and we carry that inspiration with us. So we're gonna start our time today by a visual, with a visualization exercise. What I'd like for you to do is take just a brief moment and think about a person, a group of people, someone that you know personally could be yourself. That is your why. Why do you get up every day and do this work? If you feel so inclined, let's put it in the chat. I'm gonna share with you my why. The woman uh, in blue is my mother. The woman in, wa in white sitting next to her is my aunt. My aunt is now deceased. My mother is still alive at 90 years old. Here is why she is my why for what we do and particularly for our adult students. Because my mother at 17 years old, along with her sister, Dora, seated, seated next to her in this photo, they made the decision that they were going to be part of the Appalachian migration. And they, as, as not even adults, left uh, their home in Virginia and they came to Ohio. My mother started as an uh, accountant, uh, a technician, we would call it today. Uh, and she worked many, many, many different jobs when she came to Ohio. Every week, she sent money back. Every week, my aunt sent money back. They brought their entire family to Ohio. My grandmother and grandfather, my uncle, they brought everyone to Ohio because it was part of their family journey. It was their commitment to forge a better path. My mother went to Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio as an adult. It was that transition that got her from an accounting technician to working at National Cash Register Company, NCR, where she worked uh, her entire adult life until uh, she uh, had me. <laughs> and uh, then she transitioned to a different type of work. That one act has had generational effects for not only two generations, but three different families. This is why I do what I do, because my mother was an adult student at a community college. And that successful completion changed her trajectory, her family's trajectory, and my family's trajectory. So put your why in the chat. So as we go through this morning, we're going to talk about a personal framework, because as Dr. Stout said, this work can be hard. So we need to ground ourselves in why are we doing this work? And it's personal, so personalize it. Keep your why with you and refer to it often. So is this a reckoning? You can't go a day without seeing a new report about the challenges within higher education and within our sector in particular. We are bombarded with strong, sometimes negative words, reckoning, losing faith, crisis. They loom large. But the rhetoric aside, the question that this summit is asking us and we are asking our, of ourselves and our institutions is this. Do we deeply understand the stories and experiences of our adult students and our systems? Are they strong enough to ensure their success? So I may drop a few spoiler alerts along the way this morning, and here's the first one. A strong, equitable student success practice, that is our best adult enrollment strategy. Strong student success foundation. We have a lot of work to do, that's to be sure, but we're starting from a position of strength. So perhaps this isn't a reckoning, but, it is in fact an uncomfortable truth. We have been losing adult students for some time. It has been more pronounced since the pandemic with the effects of the labor market and population shifts. 
And at Columbus State, we're not immune. In fact, what we know about our adult students is that when they leave us without a credential, they leave higher education altogether. So what does this say about the effect of our work and losing our adult students on our communities? So, yep, we're coming out of a pandemic. Uh, inflation uh, pressures are real. We have a, an incredibly tight labor market. We have been losing adult students. All of these things are true. The media rhetoric toward our sector is it's understandable that many of us may feel a bit frustrated, overwhelmed, unsure. I know I do on many days. But I would argue that we have every reason to feel like this. We have every reason to start from a position of strength, friends, because adult students are our sector's students. So as you're developing your personal framework or considering the development of your personal framework in this work, approach the work from a position of strength. So here's another chat opportunity, everyone. This is not only a position of strength in our professional work, our expertise that we bring to the field, but this is ensuring that we are as humans physically and mentally prepared every day to do this work. So in the chat, if you feel inclined, what are the ways that you personally start from a position of strength? For me, I row, I run, I read, like Karen, I meditate. Some of us uh, engage in clean eating. Some of us maybe not so clean eating. We engage with friends, family. What are the things that we do every day to ensure that we're personally starting from a position of strength? Because if we are not personally strong, both physically and mentally, how can we be strong for our institutions how can we be strong for our adult students? Most importantly, trust and use your inherent expertise and passion. We all got into this work and working at a community college for a reason. And I can already feel the power of today with 900 of us in community together to understand how we serve our students better. The power of that expertise, that is something that is immeasurable. Because we also know the following. This is our time. This is the golden age of community colleges. This book, Daryl West, The Future of Work, this was written before the pandemic. It was true then, it is especially true now that community colleges, we are the ones that are the beacons of perpetual learning. We are the ones that can serve adult learners, not only because there's a population decline in traditional age learners, but because our society, our work is going through inherent disruption and we are built to serve adult learners, yes, we have work to do. We have design thinking to re-engage with on this front, but we are the ones that have the deepest alignment with employers. And again, pre-pandemic, EDUCAUSE 2018, what did it say? This is about the future of the IT profession, but doesn't this ring true about our work broadly? Lifelong learning, and lifelong learners are the majority of enrollment. Think about our own enrollment patterns and your enrollment patterns. The numbers of students who stop in and stop out. So Dr. Stout's comments about having seamless on-ramps and off-ramps throughout a person's career, this was in 2018 when this article was written. And think about what the opportunity is on this front today. 
10-year undergraduate degrees become the norm. We know our adult students, they do not consume higher education in any kind of linear fashion. They don't do that. Their worlds are busy. They have uh, rich and fulfilling lives in many cases. And we shouldn't assume that they need to be retrofitted into a traditional learning model. And badging and credentialing, that's more and more and more important. And we are gonna talk about that here in a little bit. But mostly here's what we know about our adult students. This information came from uh, Columbus State and two sources, uh, our adult uh, learner survey that we did uh, in uh, 2019, just before the pandemic, uh, and focused work, which I'll talk about here in a little bit around uh, our student parents and especially uh, our, our um, parents who are mothers. So our adult students are resilient. They have a strong desire and sense of purpose. They are motivated both intrinsically and especially by their families. It is commencement season. How many of you have seen graduates walk the stage, both parent and child together? I have. Think about the audience at commencement. Think about how our adult students, when they cross that stage, who are they thinking? They are thanking their children, they're thanking their partners, they are thanking their parents, they are thanking their friends. We know that they're not homogenous. They are parents, they are veterans, career changers, re-enrollees, first time in college. Our adult students are 25, 36, 48, 55 years old. They are black, they are brown, they are LGBTQ. They are the wide array of our society and our communities. And they bring those diverse backgrounds to our campuses and we are better for it. And we know that our adult students need flexibility in course scheduling, in course length, in types of support services. But more than, at least on our campus, more than any other student population, when we contextualize and communicate directly with our adult students, they pay attention. And our adult students have higher course success rates. So they want to be here and they do well. So all of this leads to this rallying cry. If not now, friends when? If not us, who? Because as Karen said in her opening remarks, we are the engine that powers communities toward equitable economic mobility. And I firmly believe that we are the only sector who can build and sustain an adult student experience. But it is true that we have some work to do. So uh, Chronicle of Higher Education in 2023 uh, did a, a kind of an environmental scan uh, of adult learners. Uh, and where was there a last enrollment stop? Yep, it was with us. And adult students, when they fall out, they didn't because they couldn't do the work. They fell out because the system wasn't built for them. Maybe they didn't have the flexibility. So uh, Brookings did a case study uh, for uh, our colleagues in the Virginia Community College system. You might be familiar with this case study, but they did a case study of students who left with no degree between 2009 and 2014. Why did I choose this as an example? Because as we saw in the, in the data earlier, as Dr. Stout mentioned in her opening remarks, we have been losing adult students since 2011 in our sector. So what did those findings include? Here is another chat opportunity, friends. What did those findings include? That the earnings premium for completing their chosen degree wasn't significant enough, or they could make more money in their current job. This directly maps to, if we are putting adult students into low 
wage career fields. Academic readiness was a factor for some, but most consistently performed well academically and then saw a decline immediately before their departure. So what does this tell us about our systems, about our design? What does it tell us about our career discovery and program selection process? Are we, are we really thinking about pathways that lead to high wage careers? What does it say about our funding models and support for adult students who are working, but they're currently not working in economically mobile career fields? How do we fund them and invest in them to make the jump? So again, be thinking about this and put this in the chat if you're so inclined. And what does it say about our student support and alert models? So in case you're curious, Columbus State also went through a similar type of analysis. And we surveyed our students, our adult students, with 30 or more hours, same type of, of uh, of a uh, category uh, as, as the Virginia uh, study and the Brookings case study. We looked at full and part-time students. 81% intended to, to finish a credential. Why didn't they? Because of earnings, lack of flexibility, class scheduling, advising, and in some cases, transfer issues. Sound familiar? My suspicion is, you, there might be a lot of head nodding now across the country as we're reckoning with what is it that we are or are not doing to support our adult students. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, do we know what our adult students need? So here's another spoiler alert. We may have more of the answers than we realize. So as we're continuing to add to the personal framework around the urgency of doing this work this morning, let's adapt from a strong foundation. And again, this is not only a strong professional foundation of proven theoretical frameworks, of things that we do every day to sharpen our saws professionally, articles that we read, books that we read, how our institutions think about professional and theoretical frameworks to advance the work. But it's also ensuring that we have a strong personal foundation. What are the habits that we do every day as practitioners in the field, as leaders in this sector and in our communities to ensure that we are personally full and are personally strong and have a strong foundation from which to continue to do this work? So personalizing the work, approach from a position of strength, not from a position of, of feeling overwhelmed, although it's understandable when we do, and let's adapt from a strong personal and professional foundation. So what does that mean for us, for adult students? It means amplifying and adapting what we already know to be true. As Dr. Stout and Dr. Trent said at the beginning of our time together today, we have done this, many of us, for our 18 to 21 year olds. So there isn't anything that I am going to share today that is uniquely new. In fact, in some cases, it would be easier if it were. This isn't about something that's new. This is about deeply understanding our adult students and adapting to who they are and the lives that they bring with us or with them to our college campuses. So the theoretical frameworks that many of us are already using, whether it's achieving the dreams, ICAT framework, guided pathways, the lost momentum framework that Columbus State uh, has chosen as its theoretical framework, uh, regardless of which one it is. Those are the foundations for strong student success experiences. And we have done it in many cases, again, for our 18 to 21 year olds, what we need to be thinking about 
is how do we adapt that framework for our adult students? So what does that include? Knowing our students and their stories. We need to be doubling down on disaggregating both quantitative and qualitative data. We have done a really good job in the recent years of disaggregating our data by race, ethnicity, and income. But what about parenting and caregiving status? What about veteran status? What about goal intention? What is your goal? What type of career do you want to have? How about putting that career discovery at the beginning of our processes instead of a transactional, what major do you, would you like to enroll in? What about looking at completion and placement rates? A strong disciplined student experience framework that is equity-centered, outcomes-based, academic and non-academic student supports, career discovery, exploration, and transition embedded, embedded across the entirety of the framework inside and outside the classroom. Strong community and employer partnerships. In our sector and in our communities, what we know is true is our employers, many of them, and our community partners, they are our biggest supporters and innovation partners using them strategically to scale proven best practices for adult students and to test what can or should be, that's what those in partnerships mean to us and mean to our adult students and mean to the communities that we serve. And finally, pushing policy. We need to use what we're learning and our successes in this work and yes, our challenges, to continue to change local, state, and national policy. So for the next couple of slides, I am going to focus on what we're doing uh, at Columbus State and to provide a few examples. So as we're thinking about at Columbus State, a strong discipline student experience framework, uh, we're really looking at it across two areas. Deep sustained adult student belonging no wrong front door, from communication to really creating a sense of belonging and interrogating every practice through an adult lens, flexibility and intervention, program length, course length, days and times, prior learning assessment, making help unavoidable in academic and non-academic support uh, interventions, and from traditional aid and scholarships to partnerships and packaged funding models that invest in adult students. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a moment. So I'm gonna start with a case study of our college uh, uh, success for single mothers grant. We were fortunate enough uh, to be part of the program that the National College Transition Network funded by ECMC uh, put together uh, in 2020 where we really took a deep dive in our single mother students. We have since adapted that to, uh, to parenting and caregiving students because we know that not all of our student parents are mothers and we know uh, that many of our caregiving students have the same types of attributes uh, as our uh, parent students. So what we started with doing is really taking a deep dive in understanding the intersectionality of being a parent and a student uh, and what does that mean? Uh, and you'll see here uh, that 80, almost 83% work part-time, many uh, worked full-time, uh, how they pay for college, what the program progress is, the, um, the demographic breakdown of these students, uh, mirrors uh, uh, what uh, Columbus and Central Ohio uh, looks like demographically. And then we went further. And we really wanted to understand what are the life circumstances of our parent students. And what you'll see is that it wasn't, uh, it, that, that there are so many across transportation, housing, childcare, food, that are right in the somewhat stable. That's where we can make help unavoidable. So what have we done? 
This is one snapshot of what we have done in this space, which is to ensure that from application all the way through the student experience, parents feel a sense of belonging on our campus through classroom and non-classroom interventions and programming, that we are taking in the data and that as parent, as our student circumstances change, they have the opportunity to let us know about that. Again, no wrong front door. And for us to be in really good communication with them about their parenting status, their challenges, and what does it mean and how does it show up in the student experience that we are designing for student parents. Community and employer partnerships. So for us at Columbus State, we have a very strong ethos and, have, and many years of working with employer partners. Here's why, here are three case studies. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Intel uh, on why this is really important in the work of adult students. Huntington Bank uh, has uh, worked with us and partnered with us. And what you'll see across all of these case studies is that this starts with partnership. This starts with co-creation, but the, but the outcome isn't about the partnership. The outcome is about the adult students and what their pathway to economically mobile careers is. So the student is at the center, the partnership is in the engine. The exact track program at, a, at with Huntington Bank is an incumbent employee program where we have uh, employees in call centers uh, across Huntington Bank. They came to us because they wanted to have an internal talent development pipeline that had a specific focus on advancing black and brown employees at Huntington into managerial tracks. We co-created a model with them where students simultaneously Huntington Bank employees and adult students at Columbus State simultaneously complete an, an Associate of Science and a Bachelor's of Science with a partner university, Franklin University, together. It ensures that they are set up with career uh, uh, counseling along the way, that they're ready for employee advancement. The single biggest innovation uh, of many that came out of this program uh, is tuition reimbursement. So we were able to work with Huntington to change their corporate policy so that instead of saying to, a, to a, an employee, yes, we'll pay for your education when you show us that you have succeeded, they flipped the script and they've said, we are going to invest in you, Huntington employee, by pre-imbursing, paying for your tuition in advance because we invest and believe in you. I'll come to Intel last. We have an adult program, uh, an adult promise program that has come up between the city of Columbus, uh, Col Franklin County uh, Job and Family Services, and I Know I Can, which is our college access program, to specifically reach back out to young adults. The innovation that had been lost um, due to the pandemic uh, that dropped out of uh, high school or college during the pandemic. The reason why this uh, innovation is important is because this is a no wrong front door partnership. Regardless of where a student shows up, at the job center, at Columbus State, at I Know I Can, we are working together in terms of leveraging graded funding, leveraging all of our scholarship assets together, again, so that, this, that the individual doesn't have the burden of paying for college, and that we are getting them into high wage career certificate based that are stackable to degree programs because we know that the pandemic has had disproportionate effects on so many of our younger adults uh, in our communities. Finally, you may have heard uh, that Intel uh, has made a significant uh, United States investment. We are very fortunate that they have done that uh, in central Ohio. Uh, what we are co-creating with Intel globally that is playing out here in the Midwest is a certificate-based pathway that has multiple on-ramps on and modalities, different course lengths for different types of adult students, a specific focus by Intel 
this has been their, their mantra from the beginning that our workforce will be diverse. It will be especially uh, targeting women, uh, black and brown communities and veterans, career exploration and advancement along the way. And again, a braided community funding model so that the students aren't bearing the burden of paying for this and then seeking reimbursement. So how has that played out for us? Our, we have, I have been in higher education in Ohio uh, for several generations. And I have never seen this state move this fast around serving adult learners. What does it mean? We now have a certificate that is expressly designed to grow economic mobility and grow the ecosystem, the semiconductor ecosystem talent pipeline by embedding mathematics and career exploration into the certificate program. What does that mean? That means that if you are not college ready in math, if you have the fear of math like the Indian River College student had, that's okay. You can start this certificate and we will help you along the way by embedding applied math throughout the certificate, facilitating structured wraparound supports, reducing the amount of uh, repetitive coursework uh, and avoiding lost, uh, lost credits and preparing people for an economically mobile career. Intel is then leaning in and saying, yes, once, the, once these certificate holders uh, are employed at Intel, then we pick up with tuition pre-imbursement and we take them the rest of the way in their career field. Let me close with this. You, we started our time together with our why. Here are two students from Columbus State. Beth and Andrea. Beth had her son six weeks before her finals here at Columbus State. What was our response? And I'm sure this is your response at your colleges across the country. Whatever you need, we are here for you. Andrea, she decided that she wanted to expand her horizons and move from being an electrician to owning her own company. Classes when I need them and internships opened up and freed my world. So this is my last nugget uh, for your personal framework. This is gonna take discipline, this is gonna take drive, and this is gonna require that we take risks, but never forget that you, that we, we are purpose built for this moment. I wanna thank you for giving me time to, to share some thoughts with you this morning. Let's please continue the conversation. You see my email on the screen and I wish all of you a very successful, rewarding and thought provoking Adult Learner Summit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. We all love a good nugget and you dropped many for us. I also want to thank Dr. Stout for opening the summit and for framing today's conversation. As you can see, we are in for quite a bit of strong content and great storytelling. I invite you to share today's experience on social media using hashtag ATD today. We will now have a five minute break, after which we welcome you to join us in our three breakout session options. As a reminder, the Zoom links for each session can be found in your PDF agenda. We'll see you there.